Welcome to our candidates forum for Oregon House Districts 50, 51, and 52. This session will last approximately one hour and 45 minutes. I'm your moderator, Dr. Deb Frick, with the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that works to help citizens to make informed choices in elections. We do not endorse any candidate nor any political party, but rather we give voters the information they need to select a candidate. If you are thinking about joining, membership information is available uh, on our website and at the table at the back. We thank the Multnomah Bar Foundation, Sarah Fruing Fund, Paloma Clothing, and Neil Kelly for their generous contributions to our education fund to make these forums possible. Today's forum is being recorded by Metro East Community Media. This forum will also be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website at lwvpdx.org. To view the forums on local access cable TV, see the playback schedule posted on our website and in your program. Ballots started being mailed out today, or actually yesterday, October 15th. So you should receive yours soon if you haven't already. Okay, now to our forum. The League of Women Voters has invited all the candidates running for Oregon House of Representatives, District 49, 50, 51, and 52. Present today and seated at my left in the order to which they appear on the ballot are candidates for District 50. We have Dan Christensen and Carla Peluso. Candidates for District 51 with Jody Bailey and Shamia Fagan. And District 52, Stephanie Nystrom and Mark Johnson. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We will begin with the candidates' opening <coughs> statements, and candidates will have three minutes to introduce themselves and their platforms. Timekeepers in the front row will signal a 15 minute warning. 15 minute? I'm sorry, 15 <laughs> seconds. Oh, Good catch. Oh, like Good catch. You know, other we'd be we'd he'd be here for three hours. Um, <laughs> and then we'll have a stop sign up that says, please stop talking. Okay, so we'll start in the order that you're seated. So Dan, would you please uh, give us your your three minute spiel for District 50? Thank you. Well, thank you to the League of Women Voters and uh, all of you who have come out this evening for this opportunity to engage in civil discussion of the important issues that are facing our community and our state. You know, as I've walked through our district and I've knocked on many, many hundreds of doors, I've met some amazing, capable, insightful citizens who have confirmed to me our many shared values. Among other things, they value harmony. More than celebrating diversity, fo focusing on that which divides us, they, like me, believe we should focus instead on what unites us and what we can accomplish together. They are tired of politics as usual, politicians as usual, and problem-plagued policies as usual. And anyone who knows me will tell you that as usual is not on the list of things that describes me. Those on the school board have heard me say more than once that nothing changes until something changes. In this election, we have the opportunity to send a strong message to Salem that Oregon is ready for a new definition of normal that we're ready for a new Oregon renaissance, breathing life into dormant industries and unleashing the amazing capacity of Oregonians to effectively manage their own businesses and lives free from constant intrusive second guessing by government. You know, in 1997, Oregon became famous for death with dignity, legislation that granted terminally ill people the right to determine when and how they would die. You know, perhaps it's time to reassert our right to life with dignity affirming the right of the people to determine when and how they will live, the right to choose how to raise and educate their own children, the right to determine how to run their own businesses in, co in cooperation with their local communities, and the right to choose their own doctors and make their own medical decisions. A government should be the safe, secure context within which free people govern themselves. We must return government to acting as guardrails rather than toll booths, speed bumps, detours, and roadblocks on the road to sustainable economic vitality. My role as your elected representative is to wield your power, the power of the people to govern the government. And in Salem, I will press our rightful demand that state government begin once again trusting the people and their local elected officials with the task of dealing with local issues and problems. 
I'm looking forward to our discussion of the issues this evening, and I thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you, Dan. Now, Carla. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. It's great to see you all. After 35 years of public service, both personally and professionally, I find myself ready, willing, and able, and excited to expand that service area to a greater service district. I'm abandoning retirement and have set my sights on the Oregon House of Representatives, District 50, representing the city of Gresham and a small piece of East Portland. I have lived, worked, and played in Multnomah County for 35 years. 30 of those years as a Gresham police officer, my last six years as police chief. I've been blessed with a healthy, bright, thriving, and now 21-year-old daughter, Kate, who, will begin her, or who has begun her senior year at Willamette University this fall and is supro strongly supporting her mother in this endeavor. As police chief, I have managed more than 160 employees, a $22 million budget in the fourth largest city in Oregon. Each year, under my management, budget surplus was returned to the general fund. When it comes to fiscal management, I am a strong proponent of transparency and accountability. Shortly after retiring, I was elected to the Gresham Barlow School Board and am now in my second ter term. Throughout my adult life, I have advocated for after-school programs so that our kids have a safe and healthy place to be in the afternoon hours. I balanced my law enforcement career with community service. I have served on the Board of Human Solutions for 16 years. I have chaired the Multnomah County Commission on Children, Families, and Communities for 12 years. I was a member of the West Gresham Elementary School Site Council. I am a member of the Salvation Army Advisory Council. An act, and an active volunteer with Snowcap Community Charities and a member of the American Association of University Women. And whenever possible, I have not refused to host an event, MC an event, auctioneer, dance the waltz like never seen before for the local Elks Club, be a keynote speaker or push a bed in the annual bed races. I have now, however, had enough of dunk tanks. <laughs> for me, these are opportunities to give back to my community. As I enter this political arena, I have set three priorities. Public safety, keeping our communities safe by maintaining strong programs and funding for the criminal justice system. Education, providing all our kids a first-class education by providing a well-funded and safe environment for learning. Family success, advocating for working-class families by supporting programs and policies designed to prevent and reduce poverty. My resume is unique. I have been a union member, shop steward, organizer, and negotiator. As police chief, I had an entirely different role. I have been on both sides of the table and successful on both sides. My public safety background, my passion for our kids and schools, and my community service fuel my drive and excitement for this run to the Oregon House of Representatives. My commitment to my community is the same commitment I make to you. My door will always be open to hear every side of the discussion and debate. I ask you for your support and would be honored to have that support. Thank, Thank you. you. For District 51, Jody. Thank you. I'm Jody Bailey. I'm candidate for House District 51, which is most of Happy Valley, some of Clackamas, Southeast Portland, Gresham, Boring, I would like to uh, just say thank you for letting us be here tonight and for this opportunity. Caring, incredibly passionate, hardworking, determined, experienced, community connected, and a leader. This is who I am as a mother of three amazing children, Eric who's 17, my daughter Samantha who's seven, uh, sorry, Eric is 19, Samantha's 17, and my youngest is 12, Caitlin. I've also been married 20 years to my best friend, Kevin, who's always here to support me, walks and knocks doors with me every day. He's amazing. And I'm also director of membership for the Building a Better America Council, which I couldn't be more proud of. Every day I'm out there advocating for job creation, job retention, and keeping the money local by getting everyone in the construction industry to use American-made, Oregon-made products. I think that is gonna go a long way. We've been told already across the United States, if ever, every builder just used 5% more American-made products, we would create 220,000 jobs and put 14 billion back into the economy. That's from the Boston Consulting Group, study they did in about 2011. I've been a worker and I've been a business owner. I've had a lot of experience working in grocery industries for over 10 years starting out my careers. I've worked in childcare. 
I've been in sales, worked for a church, been an admin, receptionist, secretarial, many different things. I've signed both sides of the paycheck. I've been a business owner. So I can see many different perspectives. I bring that to the table and I can bring that to you in your community. I want to look at every single perspective. I want to hear from every voice. I think that is so important, something that we are lacking today. People aren't listening to each other. There's no better way to learn everybody's experiences than to listen to each other. We need to keep doing that. It is foremost. I have put my cell phone number on every single flyer I put out, my email address, and I tell everybody at that door, call me anytime. I want to hear your experience. I want to hear your perspective. There is no better way for me to take your voice to Salem than to be talking to you. Doesn't matter if we agree or not. If I am your representative, I have to represent every voice, not just those that agree with me. I do not know best. You know best how to live your life, how to run your businesses, and I'm going to take your voice to Salem, not just my own. I've been involved in my community. I volunteer for many things. Molly's Fund Fighting Lupus, uh, many different areas, public safety. I community connected. When I was knocking doors in Portland, and there was a community that said, we've been having so many problems with crime, I said, well, you know what? Let's solve that now. I'm not waiting. And we got a crime prevention specialist to come in and help that community. That's what you're going to get from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shamia. First of all, I'm battling a head cold, so excuse me. I do have a deep voice. It's not usually this deep. <laughs> in 1991, I was a 10-year-old girl living in Dufour, Oregon. My dad was a single parent trying to raise three kids by himself and not being able to do so all the time. Uh, there were moments where the only reason we were able to eat was because a generous neighbor would put a bag of groceries on our front porch or a member of our church would help us pay the rent that month. My mom wasn't able to be around for us because she was struggling with drug addiction and was homeless on and off the streets of East Portland. You'd think I was pretty hopeless. But that year I had an encounter with a teacher in fourth grade who gave me, instead of chastising me or disciplining me for doing what other hurting kids do, which is act out, lash out. He gave me an opportunity and he invited me to join an after school chess club. And so I did. And by the end of that year, I traveled from tiny little Doofer to Portland and took first place in the Oregon State Chess Tournament. And I've been milking that trophy now for 20 years. <laughs> But it was an incredible experience for a kid like me because for the first time in my life, I knew that I didn't matter, that I didn't have everything that other kids had. I could compete with anyone. And I'll never forget the way that I felt when my older brothers, instead of picking on me, which is usually what older brothers do, they were hoisting my trophy over their heads and they were chanting, my sister's the champion. I learned that I had the same shot as every other kid. I was willing to work hard and fight for it. So I did became a really good student. I worked hard and put myself through college, at one point cleaning toilets for minimum wage to stay on the meal plan. Then I worked for a couple years and put myself through law school and built a career as a business attorney. And my older brothers, they fought for it. College wasn't the right path for them, and when we were in high school, they had wood shop and welding and mechanics classes. And today, both my older brothers own their homes, support their families, and are saving for retirement with great careers as a diesel mechanic and a welder. So as a mom, I worry that the same opportunities that Oregon gave me isn't gonna be around for the next generation. So as your state representative, I'm fighting to change that by restoring career and technical education programs in our high schools, by sponsoring over $10 million in grants to get those programs started again. I sponsored a bill to require Buy American in Oregon so that projects paid for with your tax dollars use American-made products. We expanded the earned income tax credit so that having a job doesn't actually work against working families. And we expanded the Oregon education budget by about 20% in one year, allowing our school districts to hire back teachers in lower class sizes for the first time in nearly a decade. So I'm proud of my first term. But we have a lot of work left to do to restore Oregon to the place that I grew up. So I offer my Oregon story to you as a testament to the kind of place that Oregon can be and with your help, we'll be that Oregon again. My name is Shamia Fagan, and that's why I'm running for re-election. Thank you. Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. Crick, and thank you, League of Women Voters, for hosting us here today. We're dependent, as candidates, on 
forums like this to meet you and to get our word out to the community, and we really appreciate this opportunity. When I was growing up, my mom was a single parent. She worked multiple jobs just to make ends meet, and she insisted that her kids go to college so that we would have the opportunity at a better life than she had. I'm very fortunate in that I was able to graduate from college debt-free through working, low tuition, financial aid, and veterans benefits. When I'm looking around today, many of our kids don't have the opportunities that I had. The class sizes are getting larger, the school years are getting shorter. The kids who are able to go to college graduate with huge amounts of debt. Then they're not able to find full-time, well-paying jobs. I want to go to Salem to make the difference so that all of our kids have the same opportunities that I had to have that better life. Some programs that I'm hoping to enact in my term as legislator are to provide stable funding for our K-12 system. Right now we have a roller coaster funding system where one year we ha might add a billion dollars extra to the budget and the next year we take it away. We need stable funding so that our school boards can prepare and plan for their future and our kids can have the quality education with the one-on-one -on -one instruction in a safe environment that they need. I want to help our college kids have funding so that they can afford to go to college and graduate debt-free as well. And I also want to improve our economy. One of the things that um, my husband and I own our own business. 25 years ago, we started Nystrom Engineering, which is a computer engineering business. We provide solutions for other companies and individuals. We found that many of the young people who came to work for us had never even picked up a soldering iron. They didn't have the hands-on skills they needed to succeed. We partnered with Portland State University to create an electronics prototyping lab that gives their engineering students and community members hands-on experience that allows them to succeed in the business world. I would like to create partnerships like that in our community colleges throughout the state. This would give our not only our college students, but also high school students and community members access to hands-on training and skill training, retraining that they need to succeed. Programs like these are just one of the ways that I want to rebuild Oregon's future for all of Oregon citizens. I'm Stephanie Nystrom, and I ask for your support and your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Thank you very much, and thank you, League, for sponsoring this uh, great event. Uh, last time we did this was two years ago, but a little different. Yes, I think I was there. <laughs> you were there, <laughs> doing your doing your good work again this year. I'm Mark Johnson. I've been the state representative for House District 52 for the past uh, two sessions. Um, I grew up in the Hooder Valley. I lived almost my entire life in the shadow of Mount Hood. I uh, have raised a great family um, of kids. I have a wonderful wife who's a medical oncologist, um, works with people in some trying situations each and every day. I'm a general contractor as well in my uh, other life. Um, I love uh, helping people realize their dreams for secure homes and safe places to live and helping them realize their dreams and using my hands to try to make that happen. I'm also a member of the Hood River County School Board. I've served on the board for 10 years now, and I very much enjoyed being a part of public education. And that experience has really served me very well in Salem because, uh, as I said, the best training I could have had for being a legislator was being a member of a seven-member school board for a period of time and trying to find a way to get the yes with six other people that are very, very different than you. But it's a good training because when you're in the legislature, in the House anyway, you're one of 60, and everyone is a little bit different. You know, how do you get to yes? How do you find those points of agreement? Because you can always find things you disagree about, but how can you really purpose to find those points of agreement so that we can get things accomplished? Because I really think that's what Oregonians want, and I think that's what Oregonians deserve from their state government. Obviously, as you look to Washington, D.C., you can see a lot of different examples that I don't think any of us are very satisfied with or enthralled with. So Oregon can work together, and I think we've proven in the last couple of sessions that we can. 
I would just harken back to one year ago, almost exactly, where the legislature came together to pass what was called the Grand Bargain, where it was a session, a package of bills where the governor called us together to pass a, set, a package of bipartisan bills that not only did we uh, provide additional revenue for schools, uh, the $100, $100 million for K-12, we put more money into higher ed, which allowed our universities and community colleges to really freeze tuitions this year, which is a pretty dramatic thing. We also made some reforms to our public employee retirement system, which is saving state agencies and school districts millions upon millions of dollars this biennium alone. And we cut taxes. For the first time, Oregon passed a tax cut for small business. That was a bipartisan piece of work, and that's the kind of work that I enjoy being a part of. Uh, but I'm really proud of the support that I have for my re-election efforts for my third term. I'm supported by every major business, every major agricultural group, and every major school education policy group in the state of Oregon. Just this past week, I was named the recipient of one of the co-recipients of the Howard Cherry Award, which is the given to the person who the community college presidents across the state of Oregon believes has been the most effective legislator speaking for them over the course of the last year. So I'm proud of that award. That's what I like to do. I like to find ways to uh, help everybody and to find ways to get to yes. So thank you for your time today. I look forward to answering thank your you. questions. Thank you. Before we go on to the questions, I'd really like to um, explain to the audience the purpose of questions. I've been getting some wonderful ones, but there are several that are very pointed to a particular candidate. And they're, they're worthy, but they're, they're more appropriately asked of the candidate after the forum, okay? What we're looking for are questions according to our ground rules that all candidates can answer. So I have three <coughs> directed to one candidate, and I, we just we can't do that. So I just want to make sure that you realize your questions are valued. But in this framework, we really need to to be a little more inclusive and to really see how each candidate responds to a, a given concern that you have that's general or specific, particular to your area but that all candidates can answer. Okay, thank you. Now, we're going to go on to our questions, and these questions were formulated by the league. After this, we'll go to the audience questions that I was just referring to. Now, when I ask these questions from the league, I'm going to switch responders so that not the, the same person doesn't go first. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also going to ask some questions that I'm only going to ask of, of a couple of you here and there, so not all of you will have a chance to answer. You might have had the best answer, <laughs> but we're just getting a sense of who you are and, and where you're coming from, okay? You might want to take some notes, and if there's a question that you were not asked, you might want to incorporate that point later on when you do your closing comments. Okay, our first question, and also the timekeepers are going to be giving you that 15 second warning because you're going to have 75 seconds to answer these questions. Okay, so you really have a minute and then kind of a warning, the 15 seconds. And this time though, instead of allowing you to finish your sentence as I just did, I'm just gonna cut you off, okay, because we really need to go. 30 seconds here and 30 seconds there, we'll be here forever. So could I make you. a small request, just in fairness to the, all the candidates and to adhere to the guidelines you've set, could we ask the gentleman in the front row to stop recording on his camera? Mm -hmm. Oh, are you recording? Um, that, that was not one of our things. We, we, you came in late, and we are not allowing... Can you on the camera in the back corner there yeah. as well, please? Yeah. The camera in the back here is on. Mm. His is still on. Yeah. He's still pointing at you us. You need to turn it off, please, or... or <laughs> red lights on the audio needs to be turned off everything needs to be turned off only Metro East has the authority to record this so if you have your audio on I'd appreciate it. you have everything off perfect thank you I'm sorry you missed okay. the the announcements at the beginning okay thank you thank you once again you've, you've <laughs> saved us all right or save me question one all right I'm going to um, throw this out to three people. Oregon recently received the distinction of having the lowest total effective business tax rate in the nation. Is this good or bad, and how does that play out with our state finances? Um, Dan, what do you think? I've not seen the exact study you're referring to, but I don't think uh, you're gonna, 
have a, a lot of consensus from business owners feeling like that they are undertaxed. I don't think Oregon has a real undertaxation problem. In fact, our business uh, businesses and job creators are struggling right now. And one of the things that is going on, it's not just taxation, but it's regulation, which has become, in many cases, strangulation. And I think it's very important as your state representative, when I get to Salem, one of the things I want to do is remind the bureaucrats their job related to commerce is to facilitate commerce, not to prevent it. And uh, so I don't think we have an undertaxation problem. And uh, I would I'd want to see the ex precise figures. I haven't seen them, so I can't respond specifically to those. Okay, thank you. Jody, what do you think about this? Um, I pretty much agree with Dan that I don't think that that is the perception of most business owners in the state of Oregon. Um, the d story that I'm hearing at the doors every day as I'm knocking the doors and I'm talking to business owners in many different sectors and many different types of businesses is that they are feeling very burdened by taxes. They are feeling very burdened by things that are called fees but really equate to being taxes and heavy regulations that really stop them from that are just hurdles to them to grow their business. I've been there. I know what it's like to need to take that step to hire a, a new employee that you desperately need, but you don't know what's coming down the pike. You don't know what laws and fees are going to be passed next, what taxes, and so you feel uncertain because you don't want to have to hire someone just to, in order to the next day have to lay them off or lay off others. Um, so we need to get in there and make sure that our businesses get what they need to thrive and to continue to grow and not be hampered. Uh, you know, government is supposed to assist in job creation, not be a hamper to it. And our small jobs, our small businesses, independent businesses, which is why I have the um, endorsement of North Clackamas Chamber, NFIB, all of those business groups, because they are foremost on my mind. Because as they create jobs and build up our economy, we then have the funds and the broader tax base with which we can fund all of the human resource programs that are so important. Thank you. Carla, what do you think? Well, what I think is that there is a, what I'm most curious about when I hear these kinds of numbers, and again, I too have not seen the study or, but it's, it's the type of businesses, you know, Oregon, I believe over 90% are all small businesses, but I also think there are tax breaks given to the very large businesses and corporations that need to be investigated and checked and checked out and see what the, I think there is a difference between again a smaller business a mid-size the large corporations and I do think that's an area that can be investigated okay thank you okay we'll move to our second question the state has been losing traditionally the the middle wage jobs and it seems that they're trading them in for low paying and high paying positions what can be done to rebalance employment opportunities or should that even be the goal that the state pursues? Mark, what do you think? Well, there are many factors involved with that. One of them is the lack of preparation that we're giving our students coming out of high school and coming into post-secondary education and, and the fact that we have de-emphasized the importance of apprenticeship training and other type of careers that involve skilled workforce and skilled labor. Uh, everybody's not bound for a four-year degree, so we need to reinvent, reinvigorate our efforts to make sure that we're preparing the workforce of the future. Right now, Oregon can't fill the need, the private sector need for skilled, work, skilled labor. We need to do a better job at that. But secondly, I think that uh, from the business standpoint, too, we need to provide incentives for them to get out and hire some of our lo local folks, too, that we're turning out from our, from our community colleges and so forth as well. There need to be incentives for hiring Oregon-trained, Oregon-educated students and, and skilled workforce, skilled laborers as well. But, but again, the part of the problem in the business sector is this, the pressures that are put upon the bottom line now make it difficult to hire the type of workers that they want to have. You know, we have increased health care costs, we have increased other pressures that make it very difficult for businesses to be able to expand and to offer those jobs that they would love to be able to add, add onto their employee base. So there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but it, it's a multiple factored answer and it's not, there isn't a simple answer right. here. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie, what do you think? I'm going to try to answer both questions in 75 seconds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, as a small business owner, the uh, business tax rate that, that we have, I think the study was done by Ernst & Young, as the lowest taxed business uh, rate in the, in the nation, we don't have the money that we need to invest in our public necessities, including public education, public safety, and public infrastructure. We need to increase our business tax rate to a fair level so that we can fund the necessary services for our population. Part of that 
coach back into helping our businesses grow by providing the educated workforce that we need. As a small business owner, my number one difficulty is hiring qualified, skilled labor. We creating the, the training, like at the Columbia Gorge Community College, they don't have the upper level math classes and the science classes that you need to succeed in engineering and science, the, upper, the good paying middle wage jobs that our, our state and our country needs. Thank you. Thank you. Shamia, your turn. This is a great question because we have an, an absolutely recognized undisputed skills gap already in the state of Oregon. There are living wage jobs, particularly in construction manufacturing type fields, that literally have help wanted signs up today. We just have not provided the skilled workers that they need to actually fill those jobs. So I'm gonna tell you about an exciting bill that I've already sponsored, already drafted, working on uh, for the 2015 session that one nice thing about being in a one of 50 states is you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. What are other states doing to fill this skills gap? And something that Colorado and Maryland are doing is called a program called EARN, which stands for Employment Available Right Now. And they have a grant fund through the state where they actually allow private sector companies to come together, create a partnership, and tackle those wage gaps. Let me give you an example. Let's say there were three wind turbine companies out in Eastern Oregon, and maybe one of them has 11 jobs available, the other has nine, but together, let's say they have 38 jobs available. If they were in Maryland, they could come together and say, hey, look, let's create a partnership and go and apply to the state of Maryland for a grant that will allow us to train 38 people right now to do these jobs and give them these exact skills. So it's called EARN. I've, I've sponsored it for the 2015 legislative Thank you. session. Thank you. Okay, third question. For many years, the state has woefully underfunded education compared to other states. We, and it's kind of starting to come out in our discussion. What do you propose as a strategy to reinvest in our schools, teachers, and children? Jody? Um, well, I think we definitely need to look at where our budget is. Um, I've been research that I've read so far has said that Oregon averages about $10,000 per student. Um, there are a lot, four of the top 10 schools in one report that I read um, get better success rates on less money. My sister-in-law is a school board president in Arizona. They have only about six to $7,000 per student. They just increased over her four years of working really hard to get the highest success rate in that state with only that amount of money. I think we can go look at those states that are doing it on less money, find out what they're doing right, find out what programs they've got going, what they've implemented, and learn from them and take that. So yes, we need to maybe increase funding where we need to. I think we can also look at how we're spending the money. I think the health care programs that we have for our teachers, I've been told that in some districts that opted out of the group health care program are saving millions of dollars in those school districts, maybe we should look at letting them buy their health insurance on the open market if they can get competitive, the same health care, to make sure that they're well taken care of, but spend less money. Those are ways we can put more money back into our children, because they have to come first. Thank you. Carla, how do you, what is your thinking? Well, I, I have to be very honest. You know, I don't have all these answers. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be new to this, and I know I have a lot to learn, but what I do know is that we need a safe learning environment for our for our students to thrive and, and again to learn. We need to really focus on uh, funding the basic services. Um, I think that the dollars need to be targeted towards our classrooms, driving down class sizes so that every child gets a chance for a good education. We need to look at reinvesting into education and educational programs that have proven successful. It's about spending the money wisely um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, as police chief, you know, I managed a $22 million budget and every year was able to return some money back to our general fund. So I like accountability, I like transparency in how we manage our dollars at the state level. Thank you. Dan, what do you think? Well, I've been on the school board, of course, since 2009. Uh, Carl and I were elected at the same time. And uh, we've uh, watched as funding was cut. It was uh, very frustrating to watch overall uh, state revenues and spending go up while we were taking real cuts in education here at the local level. Very frustrating. Very frustrating to watch government waste a half billion dollars on Cover Oregon, uh, a website that never worked, and on the Columbia River Crossing, a bridge that generated a lot of paperwork. Had that money just been spent on education, we wouldn't have had to cut days and lay off teachers the way we did. 
And so a lot of this is not so much a funding problem as it is a prioritization problem in, uh, at the state level. Also, a freedom issue. Very often, we are spending $11,250 per kid per year in the Gresham Barlow School District. Our burn rate is $1 million every three days we have school. And so that is a lot of money. But if we had the freedom at the local level where we know best what has to be done for our children, if we had the freedom to spend that money as we know best, we would have a lot more efficiency in the outcomes of our education. So we do need sustainable, predictable funding, but we also need prioritization and much more freedom at the local level. Okay, well, as you're talking about local control, basically, how about the role of the state in managing the transition to the Common Core? What do you think the school district's role should be in that? You know, should we have the leadership, strong leadership from the state dictating down, you know, top down, or, or uh, the school districts deciding, like, for instance, what Portland just did? What's your take on that, Dan? Oh, you're asking me? Okay. Yes. Um, well, one of my frustrations with Common Core, I mean, stan you know, and a lot of times people don't say they're all of us. Common Core state standards. There are standards. Nothing wrong with standards. But this isn't just the state. This is coming down from the federal government in a, in a relatively coercive way. We're just replacing one coercion with another, from No Child Left Behind to this new coercion. Common Core has never really been vetted or looked at or voted on by any elective body. We're certainly not getting much input on it as Carla and I sit on the school board. We haven't had a whole lot to say about it other than, okay, what's it like? And I'm not at all uh, impressed with what I'm seeing so far because uh, we've got to do more than just teach our kids to the test. We've got to prepare them for success. And that means much more than a score you might get on a piece of paper from a company that is you just follow the money on some of this. These, these, the testing is going to yield outcomes that I don't think are going to be helpful. In fact, what I'm seeing is we're on a crash course for a demoralizing uh, drop in test scores because of the way this is being implemented. So I think we need to hit the reset button. I'd like to see us opt out, frankly. Thank you. Mark, what do you think? Good question. Common Core, I think, is one of the most misunderstood uh, uh, ideas of our time. I support Common Core. Uh, in a state that uh, graduates 69% of its students currently, and of those, the vast majority need remedial education before they can go on to post-secondary education, we need to raise our standards. We need to do that. 46 states adopted Common Core. There are still, I believe, 42 states that are fully behind doing it. They may have renamed it something differently, but the point is, when the point, they, all states are recognizing that we need to increase our academic rigor, and we do it across the country so that, from a job perspective, that the, from state to state, we know what graduates, what skills they have. So as we compete internationally, we can compete that way. But um, we need to, uh, acknowledge that there is a great deal of latitude at the local level regarding what can be taught. Common Core doesn't mandate curriculums, okay? It just says these are the standards that states that school, the kids need to meet in each grade from third grade on through grade 12. So I don't fear it. I think you'll find that in districts, you mentioned Portland Public, I would say, and I'll, I'll say that those districts that have had strong, assertive, proactive leadership from their superintendent or school boards are adopting and are just fine. Those districts that have not are the ones that you're hearing from. I'll just leave okay. it there. Enough said, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Stephanie, what's your take? There's a saying in business, we're going to keep having these meetings until we find out what nothing, why nothing's getting done. <laughs> <laughs> I think our school system is very much the same. We're going to keep testing our kids until we find out why they're not learning. Since my oldest son started school in 1993, we've had uh, three major revisions in how we're going to test our kids. First it was the statewide assessment test and the OAPS test, and now we've got a new test coming down the pipe. We can't spend all of our money retraining our teachers and purchasing all new test systems while our kids are struggling with the basics, learning how to read, learning basic math skills. We need to focus our time and our effort where it counts most, and that's giving the teachers and the students everything that they need to succeed in the classroom. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears. Poverty uh, in this region you know, is, is pushing east, we all see this, causing our communities to be faced with new challenges. If elected, what strategies would you employ to mitigate the effects of these, these trends? Carla? Boy, that is, a, that is a big, big question. I, I, 
I can tell you in my, uh, my experience, certainly on law enforcement and dealing with issues related to poverty, as we strengthen our communities and our families and our education system, all those are tools that will break the cycle of poverty. And it really does start with a, with a strong base of support for a young person, our kids, when, uh, when they have the opportunities for success, self-esteem, good work opportunities, that is when, again, our communities will grow and be strong and we will begin to break that cycle. It's finding the link in the chain that can be broken to make that happen. And as we support our communities at all levels, as we recognize and honor the diversity in our communities and value that diversity, that's where those changes will take place. Thank you. Shamia, what do you think? Well, this is a very pertinent question for outer, outer East County. And I've represented East Portland now in the Oregon legislature for a year and a half. And it's been an incredible experience to watch a part of, there's, there's two different types of folks in East Portland, folks that have been there for a long time and it was unincorporated Multnomah County and they just watched apartment building after housing development you know, pop up around them. And those are policies that really land in the pocket of the city of Portland. And yet I learned in my first term in the legislature that there was actually a statewide law that actually said that, that there couldn't be a tax abatement credit for a house unless it was in a quote unquote distressed area of the city. Guess where that is? <laughs> Only East Portland and North Portland. And guess what? That tax credit was up for a sunset and renewal this time. So I dug my feet in and said, I will absolutely not support renewing this unless you remove that distress language. East Portland at least needs a chance to fight against being the only place in the city of Portland where low income housing ends up. You know, people need an affordable place to live. It shouldn't all be in East Portland. David Douglas School District already has the lowest assessed property value of any school district in the state. It passed, and guess what? Without the distressed language. Okay. Dan? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking in the wrong direction, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> you confused me. Yeah. Change my name. <laughs> well, I'll answer. It, yeah. You know, it, it, uh, I'm, I'm going to agree with much of what I've heard here. Uh, treating poverty with, with money and just throwing money at it is, is about as effective as treating throat cancer with a cough drop. It, ultimately, it might address a symptom for a while, but uh, as Carla has rightly pointed out, there are root and systemic problems that, that drive poverty. And, uh, and we. But the, the answers aren't going to come from Salem, as, as is often the case. You know, all of you have homes, and, and when you have problems in your home, ultimately the, the best answers are going to come from you, your neighbors, your family. The people closest to the problem are going to have the best bead on solving those problems. And one of my questions is, who do you know who's struggling, and what are you doing to help? And I'm going to challenge us. You know, if, if, if all of us would actually become a community, this can't be a government program. It has to be very organic. Uh, I know my family and I are very involved in helping out at my father's house. I love to see the transitions and the transformations that we see there. And it's a community effort, not taking any government money. And there's a number of programs, ways that we can get along. The answer to poverty is mentoring. It's getting alongside somebody and saying, where's your point on the horizon? Let's go. Thank you. OK, now I'll look in the right direction. <laughs> uh, Mark, I'm going to give you a heads up because I, you know, Got to get back on focus here. Wealth inequality is increasing in Multnomah County. <coughs> okay, we've already talked about this poverty issue, but the, in, the inequality, the gap. Should the legislature do anything to address this? If not, why not? And if so, what should the legislature be doing? Well, I would, I would oppose any artificial measures, I think, to take from one sector of our population and give it to the other sector. I don't think that works. I don't think time and history has shown that that, that, that uh, provides the, the necessary and the lasting results that you hope for. I would just take a lesson from, from what I learned in my own home community. In Hood River County, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the state of Oregon. It's currently about 5.1 percent. And we have an incredibly diverse economy. It starts with a strong agricultural base. It, start, it begins with an appreciation for natural resources where we utilize them sustainably and we enjoy them and we protect them. It also involves a very, very strong public education system and it provi we provide a welcoming environment for businesses to begin and to start up. All of those together create a quality of life and provide the type of jobs that I think the rest of the state is missing out on. We've got a very vibrant, strong middle class in Hood River County. We don't have the same issues that I think you have in some of these other more blighted metro areas. So 
again, I would look, I think a lot of the issues that I hear as I knock on doors in Gresham and so forth are a res direct result of what's happening in City Hall in Portland, <laughs> okay? It's, it's, it's being pushed out this way and people are not happy about that, but it's the excess crime, it's the increased poverty. You know, the issues are in City Hall in Portland. I don't think they're necessarily Thank resting out here in Gresham. Thank you. Jody? Thank you. Um, I think we can, you know, again, I think a lot of it goes back to education. It goes back to mentoring. It goes back to families. Um, and I think making sure that we're trying to connect people to the jobs that are available. As Shmia said, and as I've been talking to groups for over two years now, telling them in all the networking events that I do, there are throughout the United States and also here in Oregon, thousands of jobs that are ready to go, people ready to hire. We just need to connect those people to those and they're living wage, high wage, family wage jobs. Um, we just need to get them and figure out ways to make it affordable for them to get the training they need. And these are all different trades. You know, we're talking many different trades, not just manufacturing, engineering, although that is a really good one and one that has a lot of jobs available at a good wage. Um, and so I think we you know, even went to one that was about coding, computer coding. A lot of opportunities I saw there that I really wanna dig in and investigate with Treehouse and other companies that are doing things like that, encourage our companies to invest in the community and reach out to those that need training, invest in them, spend some of their dollars of these big companies to get people in. My son's company, Gunderson Marine, they're hiring students right out of high school that have training. My son learned welding all the way through high school. He is 19 years old, earning $20 an hour as a welder. He has got a great future ahead of him and we can do that for Thank everyone. Thank you. Stephanie, what do you think? We have a system that is unfair, and it has been unfair for many years, and it's just getting worse. We tax our businesses at the lowest rate of any state in the nation, and we, the effective tax rate for our wealthiest individuals is less than for the middle and lower income earners. We have the anti-Robin Hood complex going on now, where we're stealing from the poor to give to the rich, and we need to stop that now. We need to start making a fair tax system where everybody pays their fair share so that we can fund the basic services that we need as a state to help start rebalancing the equality so that people have a ladder out of poverty, so that we all have the chance to live the American dream and build a better life for ourselves and for our children. Thank you. Okay, on to another question. If elected, how will you partner with county and city governments to increase your impact for the general good? And I'm going to throw that out to Carla. Well, I, again, I, I want to uh, talk about my previous career, my law enforcement career, where uh, that was exactly what I did. Worked with Portland, worked with Multnomah County, worked with the adjoining cities in uh, East uh, Multnomah County to find the right answers to challenges and problems and I will cite the East Metro Gang Enforcement Team that was a collaborative effort funded in, uh, largely by the state but again it was uh, a condition for my condition for accepting the money that every city had a representative on that team, a, a police representative on that team, that we included advocates uh, to manage the team and to help at the family level in making change but we were able again Gresham, Portland, Fairview, Wood Village, and Troutdale all participated. We all participated equally. No larger city was more important than a smaller. We got the job done and we continue to get the job done. It's collaboration, it's trust, it's stepping together to do the right thing. Thank you. Dan, what's your take? You know, on the school board often I, I, I ask the question, how does this impact Trevor? I'm, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, got a child in second grade over at Highland Elementary and I want to know how does what we're talking about affect him. The, Trevor's parents and his teacher probably have the best beat on what he needs. And as we come back up the, the food chain, I, I've watched our superintendent labor mightily to try to get uh, Salem to listen to him because w those closest to the problem have the best beat on what the answers to that problem are. And what needs to happen is when, uh, when I go to Salem is begin pressing our rightful demand that, uh, that Salem begin to return these decisions back to the local level. We've, the best decisions regarding uh, these local problems are going to be made closest to the problem as not by rooms filled with certified smart people sitting in Salem or Washington, D.C. And so uh, how, how we do it is we, we simply begin to say, we trust you, Gresham. The state of Oregon came in and told us that we weren't killing ants the right way. This has been one of my fun ones, but <laughs> literally. And so we had to shift money away from Trevor 
to kill ants in a different way because somebody in, in Salem thought they were smarter than us about how to kill ants. We've got to stop that stuff. Okay, thank you. Jody, what do you think? I agree. You know, I love working together with many different people on many different things. I love to learn and listen and get the perspective of those who are experts in their field. So I would, again, love to collaborate, whether it's something we have to bring people in, like Carla said, with many different cities, or getting business owners, or whatever the problem may be, uh, whatever the thing solution we need to find, it's going to the experts in those different areas and hearing what they have to say because they're living it every day. That is how we learn best. We don't just sit above everyone and think that we know better than them. We need to hear your story, we need to hear what you've done today and what your experience is in your life, in your life, and then get that and take that and work together to find solutions that are gonna work for everyone. That's the only way to make to really get it done. Thank you. Okay, next question. What should be the state's top priority in East County? Shamia, what do you think? Property tax reform. Uh, people in East County have been getting hosed f ever since measures uh, uh, the measures went into place that created this inequitable property tax system. <laughs> if your house in East County was worth, say, eight, 90 grand back in the 90s, and you had a house in downtown Portland in a pre-gentrified area that was worth 90 grand, once the property tax system went into place, you sort of pay in the same tax rate as that home just exploded in value. And people out in East County literally write the same size of property tax check every month, every year, than people that live in half a million dollar homes down in the Alberta neighborhood. And yet, what is, what is it shown for it? So the inequities in our property tax system is something that I, I'm honing in on for the next session. I'm not optimistic that voters are gonna change it dramatically. So what I'm looking at is some earned income tax credit type um, investments to actually help people in East County lower their property taxes without lowering the services because the, they're still getting the tax revenue, but actually getting some kind of earned income tax credit for people that can show that under measures five and 50, they're getting hosed in our property tax system. Thank you. Stephanie, what do you think? In East Multnomah County, um, there are tremendous burdens that are unf unfortunately unfairly shared with the rest of Multnomah County. East County feels like the, uh, the ugly stepsister who doesn't get the, or, uh, you know, the, the money that Portland has. Portland's like the, the big gorilla in the room. The, um, when I fill out my, I live in Corbett, and when I, I fill out my taxes, for, I use TurboTax. And it always assumes that I live in Portland and charges me for a Portland tax, which I don't live. And there's just this assumption that everybody who lives in Multnomah County lives in Portland, which about half the state doesn't. I mean, half the county doesn't. The services need to follow the population. Thank you. And Mark, what do you think? Uh, I've got two answers, but I'll give you just one. Um, <laughs> I think this, the problem that I think needs to be corrected or dealt with out here is the very, very deplorable high school graduation rates. As low as Oregon's statewide average is, which is 69%, the schools out here in East County are worse. I think Reynolds may be the worst in the mid-50s. That's an incredible drag on the society out here in terms of the needs of those students who are not, not getting to the finish line. And they are, they are needing services, they are needing help from the rest of us to make their ends, make ends meet. So that's where I think as a state and as, as an area, we've gotta seriously address that issue. That's why I've, I'm gonna be working very hard the next session on a third grade reading initiative because there's an almost direct correlation <coughs> between third grade reading scores and high school graduation rates. If we can get that third grade reading score statewide up to the 95 percent that it should be at you're going to see our high school graduation rates go off the charts and i think you would be amazed to see the transformation in communities like you have out here in east county if you're graduating upwards of 80 to 90 percent of your students thanks thank you okay we'll move on to another question <laughs> which bills in the last few years do you think have been the most significant for east county and I don't know whether that means negative mm -hmm. or positive since I didn't craft this question. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you. I'm going to throw this to Dan, please. 
Wow, you, you're, you're catching me flat-footed on that one. I, I honestly, uh, I've, I've looked at a lot of bills. I think uh, the ones that have impacted the state have equally impacted us, and I think a lot of what's impacted us is the context within which we are trying to rebuild this economy. Um, is when you have such wasteful initiatives as the Columbia River Crossing and Cover Oregon and uh, any num number of other wasteful initiatives and the regulation, uh, regulation environment within which our businesses are struggling, uh, I think what's affecting the state is, is impacting the East County um, equally. In fact, I think in many ways greater, as you pointed out, our poverty rate has been increasing. Uh, we're not doing better. I would uh, point out to uh, Mark that Barlow's graduation rate is 85 uh, percent. So, but that's our school board, not yours. I get that. So, uh, and so we're we're making some improvements here. But ultimately, I think one of the the biggest things that's impacted us has been the volatile budgets that we've had to deal with at the at the school district level. We've We've had to make cuts. I mean, over these past few years, we were just delighted this past year. You know, it's, it's like people in the private sector, you know, no pay cut is the new raise. That's what we felt like at the school district. We, we finally got no pay cut so we could keep our teachers. And uh, so I think uh, focusing government's the key. Thank you. Dan, what do you think? Again? I mean, I'm <laughs> sorry, Mark. I'm sorry. That was a good one. Yeah, try again. again. That's right. Hey, do you know there's something about you? I don't know. I, I just keep messing up, you know, how that happens in life. The same thing, the same thing. But uh, looking, I'm trying to be random, see? So mm -hmm. that's, that's the problem. But I really meant to say Mark. Dan, too? Mark. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. I'm going to refer it back to that part of Multnomah County, which is East County that I have, which yeah. is out in the Corbett area. And an issue that they are, the landowners and the property owners out there are dramatically struggling with, which is an oppressive county that enforces land use regulations out there. The, the, if you talk to virtually anybody at the Corbett store on a given morning, you will catch an earful about how Multnomah County, via how it interprets land use laws, is, is exacting um, some incredible toll on property owners who have lived out there for a long, long time. And he now had what I would call a rogue county court ordinance enforcer who is using his discretion to enforce the laws in a way that they shouldn't be enforced. So that's where there's a need for legislation to clarify, to remove the gray area, because yeah. Multnomah County enforces some of these same land use laws in a very different way than Hood River County does. And Hood River County has 5.1% unemployment rate. That part of Multnomah County has a very different unemployment rate, and it contributes to the economic malaise that you see in East County. So that's something that needs to be addressed, and I've got a bill that will do that. Sounds good. Okay, Jody, what do you think? Well, um, you know, obviously we're all thrilled that when we passed the bill that got the funding for our schools, was able to put 30, 350 million back into our school system, and you know, is enabling us to hire more teachers back every day. I think it's about 3,500 we'll be able to hire back at the end of the day. And so, what is even more important were the bills that created that funding. Um, and those were hard votes to take, and some people didn't take those, but you know, in order to spend that money, you have to create the money, and it wasn't an easy thing to do, but it, it happened. The uh, legislators that took that hard vote on those bills for PERS reform, for tax reform, created that money that then the, everybody else could vote on to spend and go back into our schools, and that's crucial. Our kids do need that. We need to hire back these teachers. That is That money that was voted on is what got us the smaller classroom sizes, hopefully, as we keep going back and hiring more teachers. So that's one, and then also the small business tax cut I thought was crucial. Um, we really need to get in there and keep supporting our small independent businesses. It did carve out our sole proprietors, uh, micro businesses. I'd like to see them taken care of too, just as Carla said, if we're gonna give tax breaks to the the big companies, the small independent businesses are the backbone of Oregon. They need just as much support. They need equal uh, tax cuts Thank across you. the board. Thank you. Okay, next question. What is one bill you plan to propose or support if elected that will have a direct positive effect on East County? Stephanie? Given the success that we've had creating the electronics prototyping lab at Portland State University, I'd like to create um, a bill, introduce and pass a bill that would create partnerships like that in all the community colleges throughout the state. These would be partnerships with the community colleges and the community where they would build maker spaces, which is, in, in our business, it, it's electronics or engineering equipment, but it could be, like in Hood River, it could be food production. So uh, uh, equipment for fermenting or um, canning, freeze drying. 
and some areas it might be art production. So it would, the makerspace would be dependent upon the community and the community's needs. Tied with that would be business support services to take those new ideas and the uh, products that are created and build a business around it to, to help the entrepreneurs build their own business and, and hire people. So um, again, makerspaces and business in incubators at all the community colleges throughout the state. Thank you. Shamia, what do you think? Two words, Powell Boulevard. <laughs> I remember canvassing there two years ago, and I was actually eight months pregnant last time. I was canvassing last two years ago, August, and I remember having to choose between walking in a bike lane next to a 40 mile an hour road or going through a strip club parking lot. And uh, despite being eight, mo eight months pregnant, some guys out smoking a cigarette at the strip club parking lot decided to harass me a little bit. Um, but you know that didn't bother me so much. I thought, this is some kids walk to school every single day. So I went to the legislature as a newbie, and I said, how much is it going to cost to do Powell Boulevard? You know what ODOT said to me? Well, we don't know. Nobody's ever actually even hired engineers to design it. So little known fact is that I secured $3 million. ODOT has, I mean, it's done. We are, engineers are hired there currently at this moment drawing up plans so that when I go back in 2015, and the next time we do a transportation package, I know exactly how much it's gonna cost to do Powell Boulevard. When I got those sidewalks on Southeast 136, which had never been done, something, you know, such a massive investment in something so local for East Portland, um, I think that I showed that I can do that when I put my mind to it, and my top priority for this community in 2015 is Powell Boulevard. Thank you. <laughs> Hold our applause, please. <laughs> Carla, what do you think? Well, one of my uh, greatest passions are issues related to domestic violence. So, um, and I recently learned uh, that, that any bill that's gonna go to the legislator, legislature starts with a legislative concept. <laughs> so I'll give you the concept <laughs> idea here. Yeah. So uh, again, I, I want to, uh, I would uh, craft a bill that would uh, put some restrictions on the use of the internet to harass, to bully, to intimidate, to threaten uh, a, a victim of domestic violence. And uh, put some things in place, again, uh, it, as we talk about building strong families and strong communities, um, you know, a key component, again, is that issues related to domestic violence are huge in our community and huge in, uh, actually, throughout our state. Uh, it's that we have to acknowledge that, we have to start taking care of business and fix that, and I see this as a way to protect our victims so they can become survivors. Yeah. All right. Got another question. We just keep rolling with these questions. Name, name at least two areas of the state's current budget that you think are over-resourced and which you plan to work on to reduce if elected. And I'm going to throw that to Dan. Well, I think we've already said Cover Oregon needs to, we need, just need to, need to put an end to that one. And uh, that, that'd be something, that'd be a bill I would uh, definitely look at would be let's, let's put a stop to that. I'd, I'd rather let the federal government own that disaster at this point. And, um, and that, that any funding that gets is too much. Um, and um, I think, um, I, I don't think it's so much an area as it is a systemic problem of redundancies and inefficiencies. Uh, government really needs to be focused. You know, we hear sometimes people talk about limited government. I don't like that phrase so much as I like focused government. Uh, you know, we're the parents, government's the child, and we've given government a, a, a list of chores to do and an allowance to get it done with. Um, and we call that, that list of chores the Constitution. There's, there are boundaries to what government can do, and government should be focused on public safety, public education, and public infrastructure. Once we're doing that well, delivering those services effectively and efficiently, then maybe we can look at some of these other things. But we're not doing those three things well right now. And so that, that's where I would uh, say we're, we're overspending. It's a systemic overspending problem. Thank you. Stephanie, what do you think? It's so much easier to look at all of the, the, the programs that are being underfunded <laughs> because those are the ones that impact us every day. The public infrastructure where we have roads that have, haven't been fixed in, in m m way too many years, some streets that are, are still unpaved, our school system where our school years are getting shorter and our school days, school years are getting shorter and the school days are getting Shorter. Less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there, there has been glaring 
overspending in, in some areas, including Cover Oregon, where our contracting system totally fell down on the job and money was sent to out-of-state companies with nothing to show for it. That's, that's definitely one of the things that I would want to see is, is that our money is spent the most efficient and wisest way possible on the programs that we need as a state. Thank you. Jody, what do you think? Well, you know, I too haven't really been focusing on what things are overfunded, so I probably don't have really the greatest answer, but looking at going forward for, you know, any kind of bills that are proposed, again, everybody's been mentioning, um, I just haven't yet, uh, Cover Oregon. It's not that we didn't need a change or need to change to our healthcare system, it's that it was just no oversight. We need to make sure that there's more accountability, transparency, we need to make sure that uh, you know our Secretary of State can immediately audit something that needs, that when something's going wrong, she can get in there right away and that there's nothing tying her hands from doing that. And that we have auditing both maybe inside and outside, something like that, so that there's accountability from two different areas. Um, I think that and maybe saving money on you know the regulations across the board in many different areas don't have a specific one to tell you, but that are burdensome and cost a lot more money in paperwork and redundancy than really they're saving or helping anyone. Thank you. Um, what do you think, we're still talking about money, I'm going to throw this out to Carla uh, first. What specific budget priorities do you bring to the legislature? In other words, if you had to focus now we're talking about increasing expenditures. If you had to focus on increasing expenditures in one area, what would that be? Education. Okay. <laughs> Straight up. Okay, Mark, what do you think? Uh, I don't disagree with Carla. Um, the high water mark for the K-12 budget, I think, back in 2003 was about 43 or 44 percent of the, of the general fund. We're now at about 39. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to get that back to that level again so we have a more sustainable level of funding across the board. But it's not just K-12, it's higher ed as well. Higher ed has been incredibly underfunded, which is in part has, has led to the increase in tuitions which our students are bearing on their backs as well. So uh, definitely I think we, we need to increase our, our education budget across the board. But not just funding, but we need to have it linked to outcomes, okay? Higher ed funding needs to be linked to degrees completed, okay? We, we need to stop just simply funding both K-12 and higher ed on enrollment. K-12 should be funded by attendance, okay? If a student's in the class attending, this, the district should, be, should receive camp compensation for that. We've got one of the highest chronic absentee rates in the nation here in Oregon, and it's because we simply fund on enrollment. Uh, we can change the outcomes we can, if we inf begin to invest in education and not simply fund it. Okay, Jamia, what do you think? I, I can't disagree with my colleagues on education. I'll be more specific in two ways. One, career and technical education back in our high schools. So as we increase funding, there needs to be, we need to be focused like an arrow on making sure that all kids, even those who aren't headed for college, have an opportunity to enter into a great career. Uh, in addition to that, a, a problem I learned about when touring Clackamas Community College is that we have community colleges and we ask them to, to build in these high demand fields, dental hygiene, manufacturing. Yeah, I learned the state actually invests the same money if a student invests in a, or enrolls in a dental hygiene credit or a poetry credit. When obviously the equipment and the state mandated student teacher ratios of the dental hygiene program are much more expensive for the community college than the poetry credit, and yet they get the exact same funding per credit. That needs to change. That's one of my top priorities in terms of actually giving our community colleges an incentive to grow their high demand fields, manufacturing, dental hygiene, high tech, um, by stop having them subsidize those programs with poetry credits. Okay. What do you think um, uh, the role the state should play in, in assisting Oregonians with retirement. That's a tough one. Shamia, what do you think? So I supported a, a study bill, which I hate doing those, but this is an issue we really needed to study in the 2013 session because there is a tidal wave headed towards us. There was a statistic I read recently, and I, I'm scared to quote it, but it was something to the effect of uh, something like 40% of Oregonians over the age of 50 actually aren't safe, like don't have sufficient retirement savings that they'll ever be able to retire. So we're headed towards either having to have seniors literally working until they can't move, or homeless seniors, or a massive burden on our social services. So 
we introduced the concept and kind of said, why are they not saving? And part of the, what we learned is that when you're, when you're only able to put away a little bit per month, when you do that in the private market, their fees eat up so much of what you're saving that you're hardly saving anything. So we haven't actually, in, the state hasn't actually engaged yet in the process, but the state's looking at possibly managing some lower level retirement in a similar way that the state manages the Oregon Opportunity Fund for the, that might not be the right ter term, the college savings plan, excuse me. So no fees or low fees that, that for these low wage plans of the private market simply is not funding. Thank you. Jody, what do you think? Um, I haven't looked into this lot, but I know I would want to support the you know Oregon Project Independence and make sure that we're helping our seniors stay in their homes. The longer they stay in their homes, the better it is for them and for everybody and cost-wise. So we want to make sure that we help them do that by making sure that they we don't take away their property tax deduction, make sure that they have uh, we re can reduce some of the funding for transportation that they need, especially when they're in wheelchairs and they don't have their own transportation. Some of those fees are exorbitant and harm, you know, making it hard for them to get around um, and making sure that it's more affordable for them to get in-home care and stay in their homes longer and making their homes, you know, I in the building field years ago, I've been trying to encourage home builders to build homes that are accessible, universally designed homes so that as we age and we bring in our family members into our homes, that it's accessible and that they can stay stay in those homes longer. Thank you. Stephanie? One preventative measure is equal pay for equal work. Most uh, women, are, women are more often affected by retiring into poverty than men. So equal pay for equal work will hopefully help women retire into a comfortable retirement. A statewide retirement fund where people can save using the public employee retirement system and they can put their private dollars into this retirement fund, which would be managed at the state level, which has been doing a pretty decent job of, of uh, maintaining the savings for our public employees. So uh, allowing private individuals to save into that same fund. And also helping women, having uh, decent child care options so that they are able to work, that they have a safe place to have their children during the day so that they can work. Because many women are losing a lot of their years of possible earnings and therefore retirement dollars th because they have to stay home and care for their children. So those three ways are, are ways that I would help with our re re retirement, both short term and long term. Thank you. We're still going to talk about retirement. Um, Mark, there are, you know, a lot, there are a large number of people that are projected to leave the workforce in the coming years. And this all goes back to not just the quality of the retirees, but also the nature of our workforce. Um, how do you think the state should be able to, you know, how can we prepare for this? Well, you're exactly right. We have, I think, a tsunami of retirements coming our way, and the problem is we already have, I think at this point in time, the lowest labor force participation we've had in Oregon. Uh, it goes back to the early 80s. I think it's something like low 60s percent of the eligible workforce is actually working, meaning there are fewer and fewer workers working, contributing to the system that, that needs to produce the, you know, the benefits for those seniors, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, whatever, so we have fewer people paying in. Uh, it's a huge issue. We're going to have to face this. Uh, it's going to require enormous services. So I think one of the ways we do that is just by lessening the cost to those folks. Obviously, Oregon remains a place that's not a friendly place to retire. Our capital gains tax rate is one of the highest in the country. So if you're a senior who's going to be getting, receiving dividends or capital gains on your investments, it's not a friendly place to be, and there's a reason why that I-5 bridge and that I-205 bridge are really crowded in the morning and they're really crowded at night because there's a lot of people that are voting with their, their feet and they're, they're living over there because it's a much easier place to retire and protect your capital. Uh, but it's a, it's a big issue, and there are no easy answers for this. It's going to continue to dog our budget for years and years to come. Thank you. Dan, what do you think? Well, I, I think, um, you know, the, as I've been knocking on doors, I don't think I'd knock on too many doors where if I said congratulations, the government's now going to start managing the one more important area of your life, I, I don't think that that would be met with a lot of uh, excitement. And again, I look here at government as context within which people can manage these things uh, much more effectively. Seniors uh, really need some very common sense 
very real tax relief. I think property tax relief. Uh, seniors have paid all paid their dues all their lives, and and uh, they're you know frankly they're they're helping to pay for schools and and uh, many of them um, they paid their dues. A lot of states so uh, once you hit a certain age you don't pay the, that particular portion of your property tax anymore. So common sense tax relief, the capital gains tax that Mark spoke of. Um, I think those things will provide the context as well as really, as Mark has pointed out and others have pointed out, let's look at some other states because other states are much more friendly to retire in. And uh, as uh, Shamea points out, we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. There's good plans out there, but they're not being implemented in Oregon. And we've got to have a systemic change in how government creates context within which people can make these plans. Okay, thank you. Carla? I think a, a component that's kind of been missing in the conversation is as our uh, as we grow older, uh, we're, we're living longer. And uh, we, people are retiring out, uh, that uh, reduces their income, that impacts our tax base uh, and funding in that uh, along those lines. So we're living longer and as we retire or, uh, again, our, generally our income goes down. So we're impacting the tax base. I think it is also really, really important to recognize that issues related to aging, assisted living, those sorts of things generally aren't covered by insurances. We're having people, again, uh, having to forced out of their homes, uh, not having a, a place to age uh, with dignity, and, uh, and I am, I'm very, very concerned about that, as that will become, again, whether it's, it's a reduction in uh, taxes, but I hate using the word burden, but it will become the responsibility of government, and I think we need to we need to stop that before it happens. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move into our audience questions, and as I tried to clarify before, I have quite a few that had been directed to specific uh, candidates. They they will not be asked. If you are interested in the answers, please see the candidates after the session. I'm sure they'll be glad to clarify whatever these questions were. So I'm going to have, I have four <coughs> questions right now, and if you have anything that comes to mind, we have volunteers around. Just hold up your card, or if you need a card, please let them know, okay? So don't just sit with it on your lap, hold it up, and we will ask it, but make sure it's worded so that we can all answer the question. And I'm going to, again, randomize so uh, I hope I don't look at the wrong person at the wrong time in my <laughs> efforts to be fair. <laughs> I've been tripping up a little bit here. So I'm going to, uh, with that in mind, ask Dan. Hi. I need to, to, to pay back a little bit for stumbling on, on his <laughs> position there. Uh, the, he'll be the first response to this question. Can you give an example where your views may differ from your party's position and how you would uphold your, your own views in Salem. Well, I'm uh, not a member of any organized political party. I am an Oregon Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So I think identifying mainstream Republican thought in Oregon, I, I, I will confess to being a rhino. That's a Republican in Northern Oregon. I'll confess to that. But uh, uh, what I know are my views. Uh, and I, I'm not going to represent the Republican Party. I'm going to Salem to represent the people of Gresham. And as I tell the people on the, the administrators of the school district, when you look at me, I want you to see hundreds and thousands of people standing behind me. I, I don't represent government to the people. I represent the people to government. And I have this weird dream that when the legislature come in, comes into session, rather than the people sitting in fear because the government's about to speak, I think the government should sit in fear because the people are about to speak. And I will go and wield the people's power to govern the government. Okay. Carla? I don't, I don't have uh, too many strong positions in opposed to my party, which is the Democratic Party. I will say that I, uh, I think the one that comes closest is the open primary, is that I, uh, I think I hold a different, I support the open primary, but when it comes down to brass tacks, uh, that's an initiative that's up to the voters, and that's whatever the voters say is what I will support. Okay, thank you. Jody? You know, I have the nomination of three different parties, so um, <laughs> how I differ, I can't tell you each and every one. Uh, probably two things are that I support marriage equality. 
I think that if I'm going to represent my community, that involves everybody. I have to make sure that everyone has equal representation. You know, defining marriage is a personal definition to me. It is something that, you know, is sacred and is defined by each person, by their religion. I don't think it should be the government's duty to define what religion is. So no matter if somebody differs from my view of marriage, I think they should have equal rights across the board when it comes to their money, when it comes to their taxes, when it comes to any of those rights. Um, so a little different there from the Republican Party. Um, and like Carla, I support the open primary. Um, want to make sure that um, everyone has a voice and so that's probably the two ways that I can think of. Right, Jamia? Well, I'll give you a specific example from Session. I'm a Democrat, and I wish this wasn't a place where I had voted differently than my party, because I wish my party had voted the way that I did. <laughs> I had an opportunity to vote, uh, both on the Education Committee and then again on the House floor, to require certain schools to recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day. And I'm not one that subscribes to the view that patriotism is somehow conservative. So not only did I vote in favor of it, which definitely I got some flack from my more liberal friends in downtown Portland for, but I actually spoke to the bill on the House floor. Um, I'm very patriotic, and I, you know, the idea, I have a two-year-old, my son is two, and I love the thought of him waking up every day that he's in school, and despite what he sees in the media about you know, what our country's about, the rich and the powerful, that he gets to every day say that our country is about liberty and justice for all. And he's only two, and he has been for about six months been able to spot an American flag a mile away, and he'll say, Mommy, look, American flag, and he slaps his little hand on his heart. So I wish my party had voted with me on that one, because patriotism does not belong to either political party. It belongs to <coughs> Americans. Stephanie. I had uh, the privilege to interview with Scott Brown, who's the editor for the Gresham Outlook and the Pamplin Papers, and he said, you don't sound like a Democrat. Uh, and that was on the issue of um, financial, uh, what do you call it? I guess I'm a fiscal conservative. I don't think we should spend money that we don't have, that we should balance our budget, that our budget should be sufficient to cover our needs, but that we, we need to live within our means. As a small business owner, there's no way we could have weathered the more difficult times that have happened to us as a business, to us as a state, to us as a country, if we didn't save in the good times for the bad times. So I'd like to see us live within our means and save for the bad times to help equal out our budget and, and our economy. Thank you. Mark? In the last session, I was one of a very few House Republicans that supported a bill that would recall for the labeling and eventually phasing out of some toxic chemicals in children's toys. Um, that put me on the receiving list of some very uh, pointed uh, <laughs> criticisms from some traditional Republican friends, like some folks in the business lobby and so forth, but uh, it was a vote that I felt I needed to take and a vote that I felt good about because it, uh, the burden didn't seem onerous on the businesses to me. It seemed other states have passed similar legislation and it was one that I passed because I felt it was the best thing to do for kids. Uh, rather than the best thing to do for the corporate interests that uh, thought that I should have voted differently. So um, I don't tow any particular dogma or any particular party line. I look at every issue on its merits and decide it uh, based on what's best for my constituents and what's best for Oregon. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got another question. Did you support the PERS reforms that the legislature passed last year in the special session or would you have if you'd been there, okay? And I'm going to throw that out to Jody. Yes, I would have. Okay, and what, <laughs> and Shamia, you were there, right? I was there yes. and I supported the PERS reforms in the special session that, uh, there were two different PERS bills in the special session. One of them made some really important changes to the PERS system. One, for example, was if somebody was a victim of a crime, a crime that that required monetary compensation for restitution and your perpetrator was a PERS retiree and they had no other money, you actually couldn't receive the victim, the restitution from their PERS benefits. That was just the law. And so we changed that because, you know, regardless of who you are, if, if you owe a, a crime victim restitution, you should be able to, to you know, whatever their money source is, should be able to get that restitution. We also uh, voted to take legislators out of PERS. 
I mean, I, PERS is very different than, you know, what is tier one. I'm a, I guess I'm a OPSERVE member. I don't even know what that is. So I'm not technically a PERS member I, that I understand. I don't really know how it works, but it's not, it was changed dramatically, but still there's this weird perception of, of conflict. Um, so we voted to say, you know what, future new legislators that cannot, that were not previously members of PERS can't become members of PERS. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other one that we changed, if I'm recalling correctly, um, these are some policy issues, was the, um, voting to not allow people to get a double tax benefit when Thank they're you. in there in there. So. Thank you. Stephanie? It's really tough to keep track of, of the, were those the three PERS? We, it was an audience question, so we don't know for sure. Were those the PERS question, the there was two different reforms? Bills, one right. The, the, it was the plural, reforms here. Okay. PERS reforms. There, there have been several. There, there was one set of uh, PERS reforms recently that, that they just started hearing our oral arguments on earlier this week to, to see if, if they're legal, and that would, would have been to uh, change the COLA, which is the um, cost of living increase. Um, I was not in favor of changing the cost of living increase um, for our PERS re retirees. Um, so it, it, I, I, I'm not sure exactly which PERS reforms that this refers to. So yes and no, depending on, mm -hmm. on which okay. one. <laughs> Sounds good. Mark? Well, I did. I was there, and I, I did vote to support the reforms that we passed in the special session. And it, it goes significantly beyond what Shamia referred to. Um, you know, the bill that we passed that, that really makes the difference is the bill that did reform, make some modifications, slight modifications in the cost of living index, because that, that reform alone, and any mean test, means tested that bill. So those who earn the le least as terms of fixed income people on PERS feel the least impact. Those are at the higher end of the, the scale will we'll realize the most. But uh, had we not done that, um, there would be $250 million fewer in school district budgets across the state of Oregon this biennium. In Hood River County alone, we're saving a million dollars this year because the reforms that we made that lowered the unfunded liability of the PERS index have allowed the PERS board to lower those rates from about 34%, which is what we were paying in Hood River County, down to about 27% this year. It's still a lot, but that reduction is allowing us to keep a million dollars on the books that we can use to lower class sizes and provide added benefits to kids. So it was a tough vote. There's no question about that, but that's the kind of thing you need to do sometimes as a legislature is take those tough votes because in this case, I can honestly say it's the best thing to do for kids. Thank you. Dan? Well, of course, sitting on the school board, we, we were delighted with the uh, the uh, positive impact that the reforms had on us. I think there's more work that needs to be done. I'm, I'm concerned about the, you know, everybody's watching now the court case that, that's working its way through because if, if you guys are on that, boy, we're back to the drawing board here. But, mm -hmm. you know, PERS was beginning to eat up uh, 16, 17, 18 percent of our, our budget on uh, the school district. We were on a rocket ship to 25 percent, and none of that helps Trevor. Uh, it's just, uh, just eating right out of the budget. So I would have supported the reforms, and I, I, I hope they stay in place, and I think more work needs to be done. Um, and they call me the acronym cop on the uh, uh, school board because I don't know if people. So PERS, for those you don't know, is Public Employee Retirement System. There we go. Thank you. Carla? I, I am uh, with Stephanie. I would not have supported uh, the cost of living adjustment changes. Okay. Now we're going to switch gears again. We have another question about property tax. Mm -hmm. And I don't know um, whether the legislature would have anything to do with this, but it's an interesting question. I have two questions I'm kind of combining. So property tax values for our homes and businesses seem so inaccurate hmm. and, you know, not, not really fair. So can the state fix this? And I'm going to start with Carla on this. Well, I do agree that it, it's not fair, um, but I, again, I, I don't know if that is a state, if the state fixes that. I, I will just again be very honest. I don't know what the, what the system or mechanism is in place for that. That's why I was kind of framing it as a question <laughs> within a question because it maybe it's just what is your feeling about it. It's, it's needed. Okay. Thank you. Jody, what do you think? 
I too, kind of like Carla, I don't know exactly what we can do in legislature, but yes, it definitely has to be addressed. Um, it is not fair, and it's yeah, there are a lot of definite issues with it. Um, so I definitely think we need to look at see what can be done, and maybe our current legislators can let us know what can be done because it needs to be changed. Thank you, Shamia. So happy to shed some light on this. So the legislature <laughs> can do. So we could make some little tweaks and changes. We can't change the overall structure because those are constitutional passed by the voters. But what the legislature could do, what League of Oregon Cities is certainly asking us to do, is to do what's called a referral. So we'd pass a bill that's that's that would then go to the voters because it can't be, we can't automatically change it. But there's certain little changes they could, they could make. I believe, and, and I'm not a, an expert on this, but I believe, at least by what I was lobbying on last time, that a, I believe a statutory change the legislature could make would be a reset upon sale and Mark can tell me if I'm wrong whether we can change that or not. Because right now, again, if your home value, the reason people get confused is because they're taxed on their assessed value. But that, under, under the Constitution, is only allowed to grow by 3% a year, even if your home went through an explosive growth period. So it, it was growing incrementi incrementally at only 3% a year, that assessed value. And so the legislature could, I think, statutorily do what's called a reset upon sale. So when a house is sold, the, va the, re the value, the assessed value is reset to what the assessed value originally was, which I believe was 90% of the actual market value. So I believe we could make a few tweaks like that, but in reality, to truly change the inequities that are burdening East Portland and East County families, it would need to go to the voters, but we should step up and, and craft a package okay. to take that to the voters. Thank you, Dan. Well, I, um, I know the uh, League of Oregon Cities is, uh, has put out a uh, uh, constitutional um, initiative that they would like to see passed, and uh, I saw that. I, I think there's a tendency in politics and legislation, school boards, policy, whatever, to say because we've passed a law or uh, because we've had this passed, now we've solved a problem. And as everybody knows, in real life, every problem that we saw, every solution brings its own new set of problems. And I do think it's time to revisit this, but in a way that, that uh, protects people from, uh, th there was a, there's a reason Measure 5 was passed, and that's because people were terrified of the, of the wild s increases they were facing. And so I think we need to remember those structural reasons why we are where we are with property taxes. But. Uh, you know, with, with everything sort of being pegged off of 1997 values and, and percentages there and, and no reset on, on resale of a home, you do have these weird inequities, as, uh, as has been pointed out here, where people with the same value home are paying vast, vastly different taxes because of where it was pegged in 1997. So it will take a constitutional initiative, though, to, to, to structurally change this. Thank you. Stephanie? Measures 5, 47, and 50 created a really wonky um, political uh, system. Our property tax system is, is, is very out of whack. The um, two properties right next door to each other can have vastly different, three times different um, assessed value or tax bills. Um, the League of Oregon Cities has proposed three different amendments that would, it, or proposed legislation that would address this. Reset a sale is one of them. The, the other would address the problem with compression, which is when a community passes a, a property tax uh, measure, but they can't collect that money because they're, they bump up against the artificial limits that were set. Um, one of the methods, what, one of the legislation, pieces of legislation they proposed would allow kind of a workaround around that so that if you, if you want to fund your building a school, you can do so. I do support um, property tax reform. Thank you. Mark? Uh, I think the confusing factor in here is the difference between assessed value and real market value. <laughs> Okay, we pay taxes on our assessed value, which isn't necessarily linked at all to the real world price of what that property could go for. So, I, as has been talked about, I do think we need to take a look at that reset that when a property sa is sold, that uh, that property value is recalculated because that can go back on the tax rolls at a greater rate than can provide greater revenue for whatever local gov government is doing the taxing. But 
I do think we need to look at the root problem here it too, which is the cost of doing business for, for our local governments and local agencies. You know, there's a reason why they feel like they need more revenue or they can't make ends meet. So again, as, as the government grows, as the government has a greater appetite for more and more revenue, they look for sources of revenue and, and they look at the easiest source and that can oftentimes be property taxes. So as we do that, we've got to make sure if we're going to reset values that we're not taxing people out of neighborhoods or we're taxing people out of their homes because obviously that would be something we desire either but that's again getting back to the previous question about PERS lowering the cost of doing business for local governments is a way to mitigate that insatiable desire sometimes for more and more revenue so that's why I supported that measure thank you okay we have time for one more question and that is the following would you support real ID identification to prove citizenship to register to vote to assure only citizens choose our leaders. And let's start with Jody, please. So is this a voter's ID card or? Would, so, uh, some sort of I identification to prove citizenship. So you would have to show that to register to vote so that only citizens can choose our leaders. That would supposedly mm -hmm filter out the non-citizens? When it comes to voting, I think that would be something I would look at. I want to look at every avenue of it, because there could be a lot of things I'm not thinking of right now um, when it comes to that. And I want to be very sensitive to it, because there are so many people um, from out of the country that do work here and often live here and have families here. But I think it should be our citizens, and I think our vote is very... Um, is sacred to us and should be from the citizens that are living here, paying taxes here, and need their voice heard here. So um, I think it is something we do need to look at very seriously, but also very carefully. And I think I would. Thank you. Shamia? Well, let's be very clear. You cannot vote in this country if you're not a citizen. That's against, only citizens can vote. I don't know what real ID is, so if that's a particular term, I'm not able to address no. that. But I'm happy that Oregon's not going the route of the South. Um, because the much, I don't, the, the few instances that you've actually can point to a voter fraud are things like happened in Clackamas County two years ago where somebody was sneaking and actually marking ballots. The idea that somebody would steal someone's identity and then go vote for them? Like, I just don't know in what world we're thinking that that's what people are doing. Like, maybe go, like, go to Nordstrom, but the idea that you'd, like, <laughs> you know, go vote. I mean, it's hard enough to get people who can vote to register. It's hard enough to get people who are registered to vote. The idea that there's this mass amount of people out there, you know, stealing identity and voting, I just never have seen the proof of that. I think we should err on the side of making sure that American citizens can vote. It is a constitutional right. The story that you heard about two years ago in the South, where there was a woman, I believe it was in her 90s, and she had lost her driver's license or something, and she went to go vote. And it was like the, f it was the first time since she was eligible to vote that she was turned away from the polls. That is a much, much far greater crime. That woman being denied her constitutional right, maybe the last time she's ever going to get to vote, other than worrying that people are Thank you. out voting. Thank babies. you. Stephanie? I too am a little confused by the term. I, um, when you go to OregonVotes.gov, you can sign up to vote online, and it, it's a very nice program. And you do, I think, you have to submit your uh, driver's license number uh, along with your birth date and and name. Um, I, I don't see that we have a problem with non-citizens voting in this state, so it's kind of a non-issue. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I would concur. I think uh, Oregon citizens should have the right to vote, and I think the law is pretty clear about that. You do have to show ID saying that you're here legally to be able to be afforded that privilege. But it will go back to a bill that we uh, we had in front of us in the last session that uh, the Secretary of State pushed very hard, which would have required any kid that obtained a driver's license at the point in time that they got their license so that they would be automatically registered to vote at the age of 16, even though they couldn't vote then, but they would have to register and choose a political party at that time, too. I voted against that. Unfortunately, that bill didn't get through the Senate, but uh, my gosh, 16-year-olds can't choose a prom date, much less a political party. <laughs> so I don't know why we would try to force that upon them at that point in time. So I'm, I'm glad that that bill didn't become law. Thank you. <laughs> Dan, what do you think? Well, uh, I think the key component of the question was at the, at the time of registration. Uh, I think it, it can have a chilling effect on the vote if you're requiring ID at the point of voting. But if, if we have, you know, I mean, if there's a, if there's a 
uh, a good gatekeeper system that when you can't register unless you're a citizen, that makes uh, perfect sense to me. Obviously, uh, voting is a right reserved to the citizens of the United States, and I know we've had some foreign exchange students, uh, a number of them in our home, and one of them felt because of the impact that the U.S. has on, on his home country that he should be allowed to vote here. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's a right reserved to American citizens. And so I don't have a problem with it at the point of registration. As, as has been pointed out, if you're doing it at the, at the polling place, of course, in, in Oregon, that's your kitchen table, uh, <laughs> show yourself your ID before you vote, <laughs> and, <laughs> and fill in the oval next to Dan Christensen if you any, any help. But, um, no, I, 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 I'm okay with it at registration, but certainly not at, at the polling place either here or any place else. Thank you. Carla. Again, as has been said by the colleagues, uh, you have to show you're a citizen to, in order to vote. So that's, but because I've been very brief on most of my, I want my 15 seconds because my favorite po polling story was, uh, again, in the South. Uh, that was, uh, where uh, you were not able to wear anything that was campaign-like when you went, uh, and and, uh, and what I liked was a, a young man uh, showed up at the with Mitt on his shirt, and of course Mitt Romney was running. However, his Mitt was MIT, <laughs> and they did not let him vote. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's just kind of how we are these days. Yeah. <laughs> I have not heard that that's great. Okay, well, we're, we're moving to our closing statements now, and we appreciate the, uh, I'm sorry, what? One. Well, I, I was going to yeah, finish my one. sentence about it, yeah. Well, wait just a moment. I have some things to say. <laughs> I am so thankful for the timers. You cannot imagine. I don't know how they've kept up. The times keep changing, and, and they're, they're still, they haven't run away, so thank you. Uh, we're, we're done with the audience questions, and thank you for the audience participation. And now we're going to have a one-minute closing. Okay, one minute. That's, that's tough. And uh, I don't know how they're going to work. Are they going to give you a little warning or something? We don't have, have the hook to, to stop <laughs> you. But um, the bell. you've all been pretty good. You know, I have to say, it's hard to get a lot of this in. And some of you are just right on the money, you know, right on the money. So we really appreciate it so much. All right, we're going to begin as, as we listen across the table as we started out this evening. Okay, so Dan, we're gonna start with you, and then Carla, and Jody, and Shamia, and Stephanie, and Mark. We're gonna work our way down. <coughs> so be thinking about what it is that you wanna leave us with, that, that last thing. Why should we vote for you? And uh, how, how can you really be that impactful person to make a difference for East County? We really appreciate hearing that, okay? Dan. Thank you. While there are many issues facing us, I'm convinced that the overarching and contextual issue is the perpetually sluggish state of our economy. For too long, Oregon has been first in, last out of recessions, and simply doubling down on failed policies and outright failures of policy like the Columbia River crossing on Cover Oregon will only make things worse. As your state representative, I will work every day to insist that government focus on the essentials of adequately and sustainably funding public safety, public education, and public infrastructure, and that those services are delivered effectively and efficiently. A sustainably vibrant economy is the very best context within to address all of the issues that we've discussed here this evening. The best economic plans will come not from Salem, but from the garages, kitchen tables, and communities of indiv individual Oregonians like you. And as your state representative, I will work to unleash the promise of Oregon, and it's my distinct honor and privilege to ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Carla? I am a second generation Oregon, Oregonian, and I'm very proud of that. I believe we in Oregon think a little differently. We think a little broader. We think about change. We think about making the world better or our lives better for each and every one of us. I have a unique uh, background, a unique resume that I will bring to the House of Representatives. Uh, again, I believe I will be the first police chief to serve in the House of Representatives. I have, again, been a union member and a, and a management. I've sat on both sides of the negotiations table and have been successful in those negotiations. It's a skill and a practice I want to bring to the table at the, at the state as we continue to, 
to fight the good fight, to answer the tough questions, but we do it collaboratively, reaching across the aisle, working side by side to do what's best for Oregon. I will raise the profile of Gresham so that we are contenders in this state for money, for funding, and for recognition. Again, I am Carla Peluso. I am honored to be here tonight, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Jody. I'm Jody Bailey, and I ask for your vote for House District 51. I'm doing this because it is an extension of what I do every day. This is not, these are not things that I'm just deciding to do because I decided to run for a campaign. I was already doing them. I'm already part of your community. I'm already going out there and trying to solve problems in your neighborhoods, amongst our community. Job creation is incredibly important to me. It's what I've been working with and for for several years. Getting career technology education trades into our schools, so important. I live that every day, walk that experience with my children, watching my son get that welding job, watching my daughter work through animal science and FFA, and the things that it has done for them is incredible. And we should model the Save and Schellenberg Center. I've been working with that principal to get these policies and see what they've been doing to get these centers across the United, across Oregon and the United States. Um, so really wanna make sure that that happens. And supporting our communities, public safety, huge. Uh, I'm getting in there trying to help neighborhoods build their neighborhood watches up again. I'm trying to make sure that our children are protected from um, the sexual violence that's going on in the Thank area. Thank you, Jody. Appreciate it. Yep. Samia. Two years ago, I came to East County Voters and I recognized that you were fed up with constantly being left behind by the county, by the city. And I remember telling you, I'm going to fight for you. And you know what somebody said to me? Every politician says that every two years. Who's going to start delivering for East County? And so I made it a focus in my first term to actually deliver real results for East County. When a week into my first term, a five-year-old girl was, was killed on, I'm sorry, this has become apparent that stuff affects me so differently. Excuse me. And because she didn't have a safe place to cross the street on Southeast 136th. And her moms came to me and said, you know, this should never happen to any other family. Our daughter's life meant everything to us. We're counting on you to make sure her death means something too. So I went and I delivered sidewalks for East Portland. We're delivering money to actually build out Powell Boulevard. That's why the Gresham Outlook has called me a fierce advocate for East County and the Willamette Weeks called me the new champion of East Portland. Everybody wants to deliver something concrete in their first term. I literally delivered concrete for East Portland. Thank I you. ask for your vote. Thank you. Okay, Stephanie. Sorry, it is a very emotional issue. Um, the Right now we have a growing inequality in our state, in our nation, where the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class are disappearing. I want to be a champion of the people. We need to take back our country and be a country by, of, and for the people again. I want to be the advocate who will stand up to the big businesses and say it, the, the people need the services. You're t we can't keep giving big tax breaks to the largest corporations and not being able to fund our basic services, our public education, our public safety, and our public infrastructure. That's why I'm running, is to represent the people and to make life better for our students and our future. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Mark. There's not a day that goes by when I'm in the Capitol that I don't consider myself to be the luckiest legislator in the building because my district is such an amazing group of people and communities and from Corbett to Cascade Locks to Hood River to Government Camp to Sandy to back here to Gresham. It's an amazingly diverse and just a rich area and I really, really enjoy representing the community and sinking deep roots in each one of those communities so I can serve them better. <clears throat> but going forward, Oregon underperforms in some very, very important key metrics. Our educational system underperforms, our economy underperforms, and we're gonna have to work together to solve these problems. And I think I've demonstrated a very strong track record over my four years in the legislature of being able to work across party lines, of being able to be focused on good policies and not playing politics. And I think that's what my constituents want, and I think that's what the, uh, the, the citizens of the state of Oregon deserve from their legislature. So that's why I would enjoy having your support again. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the candidates. I know this has been a long, tough night. We're a lot done already? of questions. Yes. That, that's all you got? A lot of questions. <laughs> this is it. But before you dash off, I need to close this forum properly with a few things for the television, all right? But again, thank you. You all did such an incredible job. And I just have to say personally, 
I am so impressed with each one of these candidates. We are so fortunate today to have this quality of individual committed to stepping up, you know, stepping over that commitment line and running for office. That's an incredible uh, feat. It takes a, a lot of personal courage, and that's that kind of umph, that thing that we have in East County that I'm seeing across this table. And again, I almost, almost have chills looking at looking at this and hearing those answers. You know, all of you had such wonderful insights, and I know it'll be very difficult for our voters to choose. So I would like to conclude this forum. Uh, this was the League of Women Voters Forum on the Oregon House of Representatives, District 50, 51, and 52. Districts 49 were not present because we could not have both candidates available. We thank, again, each of these, these uh, participants. And we also thank our league timekeepers. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> nice job. Incredible job. And, and there are many volunteers around this room from the league. We, we thank all of them. And we give a special shout out to, to Metro East. The crew is fantastic. Thank you so much for televising this. So please check our website, and I'm going to say it really slowly because then you'll get it, you'll remember it, is lwvpdx.org. And you can look at all of our forums on demand, and you can check for the replay dates, times, and channels for local access cable TV. TV. Also, please pick up uh, a League of Women Voters Voters Guide at your local public library. Online, you can vote, mm -hmm. I mean, you can check um, vote411.org for a preview of your personal ballot. And uh, remember, Election Day is November 4th. As in all Oregon elections, you will receive a mail-in ballot. Ballots must be mailed back early or delivered to an official drop-off site anywhere in Oregon no later than 8 a.m., I mean, 8 p.m., excuse me, 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 4th. Postmarks do not count. This is Dr. Deb Frick for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter and remember, your vote, your vote counts. Thank you so much.